Well, good morning, City Hope Church. Just stand and let's worship together. Oh, come on, we sing. I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise in the valley.
You know, I love the declaration of that song. There's just something powerful when we just declare something and maybe right now you're like, I don't know if I built my life up on his love, but even sometimes declaring it before it's a thing, just to say, hey, I'm gonna build my life, God, on your love, knowing that that is a firm foundation because all the stuff that we go through, folks, come on. If we can build our lives on his love, on that foundation, we can know that no matter what happens, when the storms come, when the wind blows, when everything is shaken, we can stand not because of our willpower, not because of our discipline, but because of God and our firm foundation. There's something about declaring it. There's something about your ear hearing, your mouth, your voice saying, this is what I'm gonna do, or this is what I'm doing. Can we just take 60 seconds and let your ears hear your mouth say, God, I'm, I'm gonna build my life. And, and, and for some of you, the enemy's saying, what? The way you lived last week, what you did, what you didn't do. But I'm here to say, listen, let your ear hear a different voice this morning. Your voice say, I'm gonna build my life. So just take the next few seconds and, and I'm in the mic, so I'm gonna be loud, but for you, you do it. You do it, cause that's what I'm gonna do for me. Can we do that church? Heavenly Father, this morning we make a declaration. We don't sing a song because there's words on the screen. God, we make a declaration in this place. God, we're gonna build our lives on your love and that's gonna be the foundation we're gonna stand on. God, and we're gonna trust you to lead us into places we could never go alone. You're gonna lead us into places we would never even choose to go, but you're gonna get us there, God, and you're gonna do amazing things in us. You're gonna do amazing things through us because we trust you. Let your ears hear your voice say, God, I trust you. All right, this time, let your ears hear your voice say it and you mean it. Say, God, I trust you. Now say this, say, God, lead me as I build my life on your foundation of love. In Jesus' name, give him a shout of praise like you had given him all morning long, church. So good, so good. Not a trick question. Do you trust him? Do you love him? Turn around and tell somebody, say, hey, I trust him and I love him. And then you can be seated. Who is excited to be here right now? Same, I'm with you. Guys, I'm Dale, I'm your campus pastor. And again, I'm excited that uh, I'm here. I'm excited that you're here, uh, that you're here. And I know one thing, we always have people in the room online that are here for the very first time. And uh, church, do me a favor, put your hands together and let's just welcome everybody that's here for the first time. And if that is you, there's a card in the seat back in front of you or beside you, or if you're online, it's, you're looking at a, a link to it right now. If you'll fill that out, you could drop it off at the Connect Center and it's a way to just let us know that you're here. And uh, some of you have been here a while and you've heard that spiel and you're like, I don't need the Connect card. I did that 20 years ago. Let me tell you, there's another spot on that card that says, hey, please pray with me about blank. And we get the opportunity each and every week, our staff to pray for you and pray with you. So we'd love for you to fill that out, drop that off. Let us, uh, let us know what we can be praying for you about this week because we've, we've seen God do some amazing things. Some of you have seen God work in the last 30 to 60 days. Ha raise your hand if you have. Look, at that, look around. This is what God's doing. He's moving, he's doing great things. So let's just pray for each other. So you can fill that out and let us know. Uh, you're here on a big weekend. We start our presbytery services, our prophetic presbytery services tonight at 5.30. Okay, this side's so excited. I'll see y'all tonight. All right, Mobile and Foley will come over and they'll fill up this side. Uh, but it's, listen, here's the times. It's tonight at 5.30. Uh, and then tomorrow morning, that's right, Monday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning. We're gonna be right here. That'll be our second one. And the third one will be tomorrow night at 6.30. So they're gonna be a little bit different each and every time, but we'd love for you to come for that one or any one, uh, for one or two or all three of them. I'll be here for all of them. I'm pretty excited about it. And let me tell you about one more thing that's happening next week. Uh, you've been hearing about it. You got your Kingdom Builders books a few weeks ago. And hopefully, uh, first of all, if you didn't get your book, you can stop by the lobby and get one. Our goal this year is $1.25 million. And we're excited about that, right? 
Way to go, nine o'clock. Next week is our first offering. We'll have two offerings, just like we did last year. So next week's our first offering. Uh, and I just want you to come prepared. And what, what does that mean? Just pray this week. Spend some time in prayer. If, uh, if you're married, I highly recommend you and your spouse praying together. And just ask this simple question, God, what would you have us to give? And a quick reminder, like this is not your tithe. This is not the 10%. This is not your consistent giving. This is over and above that. If you haven't take this, taken the step of tithing, listen, that's first. Do that. Don't worry about it. Come in here and just celebrate with us for the offering next week, but don't worry about that. Uh, but if you're already tithing, ask God, hey, God, this year, what would you have us give? What would you have me give? And what this is, this isn't give everything for the year next week. This is just to kickstart this thing and we'll start funding some projects. So we're excited. It's a great way to kick it off and then to see what God does throughout the year. And we'll be celebrating the project as we fund them throughout the year. But God, um, guys, this is a phenomenal weekend. We've got a great message ahead of you. But before we get to that, take a look at this. Many of us have had our doubts. There are those who say today that opportunities have ceased to exist. Things are finished. We have everything and not enough. To what new horizons can we look now? Where are tomorrow's opportunities? The frontiers of the future are not on any map. It's a bewildering future, all right. Not because there are no new frontiers, but progress. I'm so glad that you guys are here um, in Malbus. Go ahead and put your hands together one more time and welcome the rest of our church family. Come on. Mobile, Foley, um, everybody watching online, and of course, all the guys at the Correctional Center campuses. Uh, we're so glad that you're with us this weekend. You are in for a treat this weekend. This is gonna be absolutely incredible. Of course, today's kind of kicking off our prophetic um, series of services tonight and tomorrow. Um, and so you're gonna get just a little taste of that. And I'm really, really excited about that this morning. I'm curious, how many of you were a part of our prophetic services last year? Okay, uh, not everybody. Okay, how many of you are gonna commit to being a part of at least one this year? Come on, if you weren't here last year, you're like, okay, I'm gonna be brave, I'm gonna be bold, I'm gonna be here. Okay, there was a few of you. Okay, let's try that one more time. How many of you guys are gonna come to one of our services? Come on. Oh, that's better, that's better. Okay, we're getting there. Okay, good. Um, listen, I'm telling you, you need to be a part of this. You need to come check it out. Um, it's gonna encourage you. It's gonna bless you. Um, They're absolutely beautiful. Um, and like you've already heard, we're gonna see just a glimpse of that today, a piece of it today. Uh, Pastor Wayne's gonna come and he's gonna deliver a short message. And then we're gonna get to experience words and season here in a few minutes. And uh, you're gonna love that. It's so encouraging. So, um, so you guys help me out and help me welcome. Um, you know him, you love him. He was here last year. He's really kind of become part of our family at this point. Um, but go ahead and stand up on your feet and help welcome Pastor Wayne. Come on. Well, good morning, everyone. City Hope, City Hope Online at other campuses. It's so good to be with you. My ears are stopped up. I've been on a lot of planes lately and they get stopped up on me and I have to blow it out. You ever get stopped up and have to blow it out? Sometimes it just happens. 
Hey, I'm so excited to be with you. Presbytery kicking off here tonight with, with my friends, uh, Beth and Stokes Collins and Mark and Sandy Job, And, and uh, we love doing what we do. And I'm here to tell you that I, there's something I want to promise to you. you. People have heard a lot about the prophetic and they have all kinds of, of, of thoughts about it. And some people think it's just weird, but I want to tell you, we're going to cast out weird this weekend. There's going to be no weird. It's going to be, it's going to be wonderful. We're not, going to, we're, not going to, we're not going to put up with weird. I grew up in a church where it was weird. And I, and I thought, well, I never want to be a part of church again because it's weird. But then I met Jesus and he's not weird. He's wonderful. And so anyway, I think this is going to be a great time for you tonight. Uh, we're going to be giving words in, uh, over candidates and also words in season. Now I want to tell you right now, there's so many of you here and they'll be here tonight and tomorrow, not everybody can receive a word. Not everybody can, but I want to tell you that's all right. Just lean into it. And I'll give you a little secret of something I do. When, when a word's given to somebody that I want, I steal it. <laughs> it's not stealing. I just, it's a ricochet word. I say, Lord, ricochet off of them and come right on me. I need that word. And I receive it. So you can receive a ricochet word tonight if you want to. And you can be happy for those that are receiving words. And if you don't receive a word, it doesn't mean you're inferior or that something's wrong with you. It just means this is not the time, but you can still participate. Does that sound good? Well, I've written a couple of books that are online if you want to find them. They're on Amazon and places like that called He Still Speaks. It's about embracing the prophetic. And I, the, my latest book is He Still Speaks to Kids. It's about raising kids to be able to hear the Lord uh, themselves. And I'm really excited about that book. It's apparently helping a lot of parents around the nation, different parts of the world. I want to share a message with you today called Ground Zero for New Testament Prophecy. Now, why am I calling it New Testament Prophecy and making a distinction? Why am I calling it Ground Zero? You'll find out as we go along. But I think it's important to understand the difference between Old Testament and New Testament Prophecy. Old Testament prophecy was about judgment and, and often about the law because they were under the law. Usually delivered through prophets like Elijah and Jeremiah. Keep, give you a couple of exam, uh, examples. Samuel was asked to give a word to King Saul that his anointing was being removed due to his rebellion. How'd you like to give a word like that to a king or a president that could put you in jail if they didn't like what you said? What about Nathan when he went to David and David was in his sin with Bathsheba and he, he said, David, you are the man. You're in sin with Bathsheba. How would you like to give those kind of words? Well, well that, at the time, those are the kind of words that needed to be given. But let me tell you, we're not there anymore. We're not there anymore. A lot of folks look through that Old Testament filter and think all prophecy will be about being judged, about having your sins called out and embarrassed in front of everyone. Jesus changed everything. That should put a smile on your face. Come on, let me see those smiles. Jesus changed everything. It says, it says in Matthew that he came and he fulfilled the law and ushered in grace. It's, so it's no longer about being called out about our sin. It's about being called up to our destiny. I've got this theory that most everybody, even in this room, know about your sin. You know if there's sin in your life. No one has to tell you. But I think it's a lot, uh, it's a lot more effective if I don't tell you about something you know by telling you something maybe you don't know. You know about your sin, but maybe what you don't know is that God has a destiny and a future for you. It's not about calling out your sin. It's about calling you up to that destiny that he has for you. That's what I love about prophecy. So I don't want you to worry that a lot of that stuff's gonna be going on. We're not gonna be calling out your sin. I mean, we may see things sometimes, but we're very careful about what we say because we wanna encourage you and strengthen you. That's what we're here for. You know, the apostle Paul made no apologies about the importance of spiritual gifts, including the gift of prophecy. And a few highlights for you. Prophecy is one of the nine spiritual gifts list, listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. It's also included in the Romans 12 passage of spiritual gifts. It's also included in Ephesians 4, grace gifts list, listed, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. 
So why would prophecy be the one that's on all the list when other gifts aren't? Let's, let's look at maybe why about that. Two things I like to explain about prophecy on the front end. What is prophecy? My favorite definition is this. Prophecy is a living word from a living God to a living people. That's profound. You should be saying, really good, Wayne. <laughs> prophecy is a living word from a living God to a living people. Of all the religions in the world, Christianity is the only one whose God and founder is still alive. He's the only one that he likes to walk with us and talk with us and tell us that we are his own as that old song goes. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that God will not speak to them. Maybe they've messed up so bad he doesn't want to look at them or talk to them. A lot of people are living under a lot of guilt and shame. And it's my heart to stamp that stuff out and to call you up to your destiny and your purpose. Does that sound good to you? All right. Uh, what does, one guy asked me in Arkansas in his Arkansas accent, well, what's this prophecy stuff good about? I mean, what does prophecy do anyway? I can see teaching. I can see pastors are helpful. But what is this, what is it, why do we need this prophecy stuff? And so there's all kinds of ways I could answer that. But the way that I most often answer that is with this little sentence. Prophecy looks for gold hidden in the dirt of people's lives. <laughs> Maybe all you're aware of is the dirt in your life. The things you're not proud of. The things that you're not happy about. The Holy Spirit sifts around in the dirt of your life. And he says, oh, there's some gold. He pulls that gold out and he begins to blow on it and brush it off and make it shine. And that's what you're meant to be. You're meant to shine for Jesus. You're meant to shine for God, not to feel like you're just covered up in all this dirt of your humanity. So prophecy looks for gold hidden in the dirt of people's lives. So when I look at you maybe to give you a prophetic word, I'm not saying, oh, Lord, tell me what their darkest secret is. Here's what I always pray. Lord, how do you see them? Amen. I said, oh, Lord, how do you see them? And he always sees more in you than you see in yourself. And that really is true. It almost seems like it's too good to be true, but it really is true. He sees more in you than you're able to see in yourself. Well, Paul's take here at 1 Corinthians 14, be turning there, is ground zero for New Testament prophecy. If anybody asks you about prophecy and you want to know where to start, or where you start and where you can end is right here in these four verses. Now, Paul had a job when he went to the Corinthians. The Corinthians were in horrible sin. They were doing detestable things you didn't even want to write about. So he had this really hard job of going and dealing with them about their sin and at the same time drawing out the gold of their lives and teaching them about spiritual gifts. So he starts doing that in 1 Corinthians 12. He starts talking about spiritual gifts. He starts talking about divine order, how it ought to work and how it should not work. And then it was almost like they were competing with each other. One would say, well, I just spoke in tongues for 30 seconds. Well, here, I'm gonna do it for 45 seconds. I just had a prophetic word that was a page long. Well, here's one with two pages long. They were competing and trying to show off with each other. So he says, so he, he gets to the end of 1 Corinthians 12 and he says, time out. So he writes 1 Corinthians 13. You remember that? If you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind. Remember the love chapter? The love chapter. That's what it was about. It was about, he was saying, look, you can prophesy the doors off the place, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. The Old Testament is about getting the judgment right. The New Testament is about getting the love right. Does that make sense? Now stay with me. This is going to even get better, I promise. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 4. So he comes out of the love chapter and then he starts back in about the gifts of the Spirit. Let's look at verse 1 through 4. It says, follow the way of love. He's just talked about love in the chapter 13. He says, so follow the way of love. Don't go back to the law. Don't try to live under that. Follow the way of love. This is the way of Jesus. And he says, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. So we should eagerly desire spiritual gifts. There's some people that say, uh, I don't want any of those gifts. 
Well, guess what? You're not going to get them then. Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. He doesn't kick it down and say, you're going to prophesy whether you want to or not. He's not like that. I've tried to come to the place where I can say, Lord, whatever you have for me, I want it. Because I know if you want to give it to me, it's something that's good. And I want anything that comes from you. But there are a lot of folks that are freaked out about the gifts of the Spirit. And I understand there's been a lot of abuse. There's been a lot of goofy stuff. I grew up in a church that was just full of goofy. That, you should have laughed at that. Let's just say that I grew up in a church that was full of goofy. I saw things as a little boy that still wakes me up sometimes at night. I remember about 10 o'clock at night when I was at a Brush Harbor revival with my family, I would crawl under a pew somewhere because I knew at any moment they're going to start dropping like flies. <laughs> I'm going to see my grandmother start doing that duck walk that she did when she was under the anointing. And I saw all kinds of stuff and all kinds of things said in the name of prophecy, which was usually judgment. I heard words like, there's somebody here that you're cheating on your wife. Who is that? <laughs> there's somebody here who's cheating on your taxes. Now, who is that? I mean, I, that's the kind of stuff I grew up. I said, man, I don't want any part of this. This is not me. But then I found Jesus and changed everything. Changed everything. Well, he says, desire spiritual gifts especially the gift of prophecy and why does he why does he call out the spirit of prophecy he says for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to god indeed no one understands him he utters mysteries with his spirit but everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening encouragement and comfort he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself but he who prophesies edifies the church prophesies just telling forth something that the lord has told you it's showing forth something the Lord has shown you. What he was saying, the reason especially prophecy is because that edifies my bride. Somebody comes in to say something ugly about my wife, they're not going to make it very far into my house. But if somebody wants to say something kind and good about my wife, I'm going to listen. I think Jesus is the same way about his bride, the body of Christ. He wants, he wants her to be edified. It's one of the reasons he says, especially prophecy, desire gifts, especially prophecy. And then Paul writes in the New Testament, prophecy is about three things, uh, judgment, shame, and call. No, that's the wrong list. It's about edification, exhortation, and comfort. Edification is, means to strengthen or to build up. Exhortation means encouragement to fire us up. Comfort comes from consolation, which means to hold us up. How many in here need that every now and then? How many need a little encouragement now and then? Am I the only one? No, there's a few of you out there that need that. Well, I want to tell you something. The devil hates prophecy. Hates it. He doesn't want you encouraged. He wants you discouraged. He doesn't want you to be strengthened. He wants you to be weakened. He doesn't want you to be comforted. He wants you to be despondent. So he hates this stuff. Pastor Lee Cummings explains it this way. The devil discourages us in the present by condemning us with our past so that he can deconstruct our destiny. There's probably people in here that you have things in your past that you're ashamed about. You can't move on from it. You think I'll, God will never be able to use me because I did that thing. Matthew Perry of the TV show Friends wrote this book about his life and that terrible thing. That terrible thing was the addictions in his life that eventually killed him. We carry around that terrible thing. We don't tell anybody about it, but we think we did that thing and there's no forgiveness for me. God won't move in my life. Lie, big stinking lie. Big stinking lie. Here's what God says. Prophecy strengthens us in our present, comforts us about our past, and encourages us for our future. Isn't that better than what the devil wants to do? Let me give you some examples. I've seen the Holy Spirit use prophecy just exactly like that. Let me give you a few examples. Number one, of, being, of comforting people about their past. I was in Texas a couple of years ago, and I saw this young man come in the back. And I just had a real simple word for him. And I'd ask the Lord, Lord, can't you give me more than that? The word was, tell him that his dad's proud of him. That's something you say in the South. I bet your dad's proud of you. 
Sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's a bad thing when we say that. But this, that's all, all that I had for him. This young man just starts to weep. I don't know what's going on, but one of the leaders got with him. I learned later that this guy had been, was the son of a pastor. He had fallen away from God. He was a prodigal and he was good at it. He said he'd done all sorts of horrible things. He made, he, his dad prayed for him day in and day out that he would come back to Jesus. And this went on for years. Well, just two weeks before this meeting, he'd given his life to Jesus. He was saved, came back to God. He couldn't wait to tell his dad. He couldn't wait to get over and tell his dad and see what his dad might say and how encouraged he might be. Well, four days before he was to come home, his dad had a massive heart attack and died. So he was never able to see his dad's response that he'd come back to the Lord. And on the way to the meeting that day, he's thinking, he said, here I am, one of the world's best prodigals coming into church. And my dad doesn't even know. He said, I guess I'll, I'll never be able to hear that my dad is proud of me. So he comes in and the word I have for him, your dad's proud of you. That comforted him about his past. There are things in your past that God wants to comfort you with by telling you what he thinks about you now. He wants you to, he wants you to walk away from those things in your past. Isn't that good? Can you say amen, Brother Wayne? Amen. Okay. Another story. How do, we, how do they strengthen people in their present? I was in Florida. I'm flying into Florida, and I get this picture of this woman, what she'd be wearing, where she'd be sitting. And the Lord just gave me a word. Tell her it's going to be okay. And I said, Lord, anybody could prophesy that. Isn't there something more you can give me? He said, no, just tell her that. I said, but Lord, just to, he said, do you want me to get someone else to tell them? And I said, okay, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. So she comes in, she walks in, I see her, I call her and I say, I say, ma'am, I just have a simple word for you. I feel like the Lord is saying it's gonna be okay. I saw her at the end of the meeting and she came down and talked to me and said the week before, maybe two weeks before, her husband had run off with her best friend. And then right after that, her daughter had gotten into a really bad relationship and had run away from home and abandoned her mom and said, I never want to see you again. So that's what had happened in the course of a few days. So she's thinking, my life's not worth living. I'm just going to end it. She started making plans to commit suicide. For some reason, she decided to go to church that day. She came to church and as she's going in, she says, Lord, I just wish I could hear that it's going to be okay. It seems to be going from worse to worse. Is it going to be okay? She comes in and I say, ma'am, I heard a word for you. The Lord says it's going to be okay. So in that moment, she hears that. She takes, she, she's strengthened by it. She decides not to commit suicide. She starts a life again. She's a Sunday school teacher in Florida now. She's got a new relationship. All kinds of good things are happening. But she was strengthened in her presence. And then the third example is to be encouraged. Prophecy encourages people about their future. I had this young guy come into our church in our new people's class, our new members class. We have what we call affirmation. And in affirmation, we prophesy over them because we want to know them after the spirit and not just after the flesh. So Dean comes in and I'm praying for him. And I just say, Dean, uh, he's about six foot four, long hair, looks like a hippie outwardly but I knew he was a redneck. <laughs> Most hippies in Arkansas are just really redneck with hair. And I'm sure the same, you could see that in Alabama as well, I, I, I would think. Anyway, he comes in, he's towering over me. And I say, well, Dean, I said, I have a picture. I see you and your wife and you're ministering in front of hundreds of brown skinned people. He kind of looked quizzical in his face and he came up after the meeting. He said, Pastor, said, thank you for giving me that word, but I, I think you may have gotten it wrong. And I said, well, tell me about it. He said, well, I'm not married. Oh. He said, and, and I live in one of the whitest cities in Arkansas. There's no brown people there. He said, I don't ever plan on leaving Arkansas. I mean, why would you want to? That was his attitude. Well, he gets, he gets, uh, he gets a job in another town a few miles away finds another church. The first day he goes into church, he decides to attend an evangelism class. He comes in a little late and there's one seat left and it's right next to this beautiful young lady. 
he kind of goes, whoa. I would think that's what he got. He was attracted immediately to her. And, and so he stays in the class for 10 weeks. Uh, they, they, they start to lock each other. They start to date. A few months later, they get married. And then a year later, this guy that was leading the class on evangelism says, would you go with me to Central America, you and your wife? So they go to Central America. They get to minister in front of people. They see, they see dozens and dozens of brown-skinned people saved. He sends me a picture of him and his wife in front of brown-skinned people. And he said, well, I guess you were right. <laughs> Sometimes when you receive a word, it's not for right now. When we give prophecy, it's, it's like it should have happened yesterday. We feel such urgency. Sometimes it's for later. So, some, so I told him, Dean, just keep that in your heart. Just keep that in your heart. Don't immediately reject it and see what God might do. And sure enough, that's what happened. Those are all words in due season. Now we're going to talk about words in due season for just a minute. Tonight we'll be doing prophetic words, and that's more about impartation, it's more about prophetic words in presbytery, it's more about gifts. And there'll also be words in season there, but here's what I mean when I say words in season. Words in season are prophetic words given in a timely way for the season that you are in. Someone said it's a word that comes at just the right time. Just the right time. That word for the lady that's gonna commit suicide she was going to go home and do that, and that word in season came at just the right time. So it's not necessarily a life-defining thing that you're going to do, but it's a word that comes to encourage, strengthen, and comfort you at just the right time. It comes from Proverbs 15:23. It says, "A man finds joy in an apt reply, and how good it is, how good is a word in due season." Well, why are words in season so important? From my point of view, Words in due season are invaluable because they help us see people after the spirit and not after the flesh, as Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians 5, 16. God saw more in Dean, more gold in Dean than Dean saw in himself. Now look at me. God sees more gold in you than you can see in yourself. Prophecy is a good thing. It's about encouraging and strengthening and comforting in timely ways. All right, does that make sense? Well, I want to give a word to, uh, to the church, and then I'm going to move, and, and the other teams on the other campuses are going to begin to move in words and season. But let, first, let me give you this word. This is a word that I think is for City Hope Church, but I suspect it's for the larger body of Christ because it's been, it's been marinating in me for, uh, for several months now, and I want to give you what God is saying, I think, to this church and perhaps to other churches. I believe it's time for God's people to resolutely proclaim with our words and our action. Now listen, it's time to be all in because it's all his. It's time to be all in because it's all his. I hear heaven echoing on earth the timely words of Isaiah 11, 9. It says, God rules from his holy mountain. Mountains in scripture refer to kingdoms, authority, rule, and dominion whenever you see them. Since 1974, when the three fathers in the faith got together and found out they were hearing the same thing, that there were seven mountains of culture, seven mountains of influence, and they listed them, family, religion, media, business, education, entertainment, and government. And the idea was that whatever mountain that you're in, you're supposed to influence it for the kingdom of God. So if you are a businessman or a businesswoman, that is one of your mountains of influence. You're not there to just make money, although hopefully that happens. You're there to influence it for the kingdom of God. It should become better because you're there, not worse. You see how that works? So my church and other churches have grabbed that and we've run with it for all these years. But last August, God adjusted me on something. I heard in my spirit, it's time for the seven mountains of culture to bow to the eighth mountain, the mountain of the Lord. Now in Israel, there's Temple Mount. That's where a lot of things have happened in church history. It's like the holy mountain, but there's seven hills around that mountain. Let me tell you, if you're in, if you're in the mountain of education as a teacher, you should be looking to influence those kids and that system for the kingdom of God. But 
you bow your knee to the eighth mountain. We must, our focus must remain on the mountain of the Lord, his presence, his house, his abode, his people. It's about God's kingdom finding expression on earth as it is in heaven. I sense the Holy Spirit is preparing us to expand our influence on culture for the glory of God by walking in bold humility. We get out there and good things happen and we get all full of ourselves. Yeah, I'm a very wealthy businessman. Thank you, God. No, it's about getting out there and being successful and turning around saying, Lord, I just give this to you. Is this still what you want me to do because I'm serving you? That's what going to the eighth mountain is about. And I think it's a time to revisit that. It's time the Holy Spirit's calling God's people to come forth to focus on this holy mountain, laying our crowns and our influence at his feet. I believe Psalm 24 has direction for the church for 2024. First of all, it's a year to proclaim again, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Second, I think I heard in my spirit, it's time to go mountain climbing. Psalm 24, three and four holds the key to pre prepare us to climb the mountain of the Lord through worship, prayer, and ministry to the Lord. Here's what it says. Who may ascend the hill or the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Then it answers, he who has clean hands, what we do, and a pure heart, our motives, our attitudes, who does not lift up his soul to an idol. A lot of our kids and a lot of our adults are following idols. I love Taylor Swift, but she's not more important than church. She's not more important than youth group. She's not more important for sure than Jesus. And I think you can enjoy Taylor Swift, enjoy her music, just don't make an idol out of her. You don't need idols in your life. And then the young people said, oh gosh, why do you say that? And the last thing I heard was this, revivals of repentance began breaking out across our nation during the Asbury revival in February of 2023. In addition to thousands of salvations and baptisms that are literally happening from coast to coast, from Canada to Florida, it's happening everywhere across the world. I heard a fresh call to offer up prayers of consecration. That means being set apart. 2024 is a year to declare we are all in because it's all his. Now, before I come and give you the words and season that I have, I just want to challenge you. Be all in because it's all his. I wanna challenge you. Ask God to set you apart for his work. Have a sense of consecration. I'm totally given to Jesus. Nothing else is gonna be my God. I'll have no other idols before him. I'll keep bowing my mountain of influence to the mountain of the Lord. Does that make sense? All right, I'm gonna walk down and, and give you the words and season that I have, if that's okay. I'm gonna, they're gonna be doing this on the other campuses. What they'll do is they'll point to somebody, maybe describe what they're wearing. They'll get your name so that people can find it on the recordings. Not to embarrass you, not to embarrass you, not to call you out, but to call you up. Does that sound good? Yes. All right, how, how does this happen? Well, so this first word I wanna give happened back in my room last night. A guy drove me from the airport and I was trying to go to bed and the Lord wouldn't let me go to bed until I wrote this word down for him. So I'm a little upset with him because I lost a little sleep, but I want to give this word for him. It's for, Pastor, for Aaron Pate. Would you stand up? It's a good guy right here. You need to get to know him. Now, the Bible says we know in part and we prophesy in part. So I know some things about Aaron, but there's some things I didn't know until the Lord showed me. I know from our talk, from the drive from the airport, that you're married to Jessica and you work in insurance. I know that. As I prayed for you, I heard that you are a kingdom carrier with an entrepreneurial snap in your makeup. When you enter a space, whether in business, family, or church, you carry the kingdom with you. You're one of those guys I've been prophesying about. Dark corners are exposed to light when you walk in. The spiritual atmosphere shifts for the better. You express in multiple ways the goodness of God and you take the focus off the problem and you discover solutions. Now listen, you mustn't divide your ministry into sacred or secular. 
There is no sacred, secular divide in you. It's all sacred inside church walls and up on Main Street. It's all about God's kingdom for you. You carry kingdom principles and kingdom truths that spread light and helps to find solutions. You're a good and faithful man. You're a kingdom carrier. Amen. Is that okay? Now, he wouldn't say that about himself. It would probably be uncomfortable folks just thinking those kind of things about him. But it's okay for me because, see, I looked into the dirt of his life as we walked, as we drove from the airport. And God showed me some gold. And so you just need to let God shine that gold so that you'll shine. Is that all right? Now, did that discourage you at all? Or Okay, good, good, good. There's a young guy with red hair in the second row right here. I've been drawn to red hair today. Ginger, can you stand up and tell me your name? Jackson. Jackson? I've been to Jackson. <clears throat> Jackson, I can see. When I looked over at you, I kept seeing something. I didn't know what it was. It's like I couldn't tell if it was a sound or if it's something visual. I said, Lord, what are you showing me? And I wrote down, I can see that there's a call of God on your life. Not for a traditional looking ministry, but a call to ministry just the same. You're going to communicate the goodness of God on multiple platforms in different places and in different hidden places and spaces. A voice for your generation will grow in volume in 2024 and into 2025. Don't be afraid. You thought words weren't your friends. God's going to put words in your mouth that's got heaven in those words. Just listen to the Lord. Ask him to lead you and he will. Main thing to remember about this morning is that there's a call on your life. Amen. There's a tall guy with a checked shirt, white hair, and glasses sitting right there by those two beautiful ladies, brunettes. Can you stand up and tell me your name? Michael Chipolich. Michael? Michael, I just looked at your check shirt, and I kept, couldn't get past looking at check shirt. I said, Lord, what are you saying? I heard him say it's a season to check off some things on your bucket list. I see you going on some adventures this year. You're not winding down. You're, you're winding up. You've been a faithful man, and God brings favor and blessings to faithful sons and daughters. It's time to shake up your routine, look through fresh eyes of faith, and be up for the grand adventure of following Jesus wholeheartedly. Wherever he leads, wherever it goes, just give Jesus your yes and let him take care of the rest. He said, uh, he said, thank you, I needed that. So if anybody else needs that, just take it. It's not stealing. Just say, I want that word. There's a young man back here on this back road had a cap turned around backwards. Is he still here? Did he take his cap off? Was that him? I thought he was sitting right here. He went to the restroom? That's not allowed. <laughs> When he comes back, I'll give this, all right? Uh, there's a lady way up in the bleachers in the right side with a white top and blonde hair. I'll have to get closer to see who she is on the right side there. There you are, the white top, blonde hair. And she, could you stand up and tell me your name, please? It's you, yeah. What's your name? Christy? God brought you here today, Christy, to tell you it's not too late. You're not behind. You're in the right place in the right time. I see you having little visits from heaven and dreams. And as you worship, as you go to the place of prayer, God has been visiting you and that's going to continue for a season. I hear prayers being answered. I see hope rising in your heart to step out in faith into the new that God has for you. It's a new day. Be encouraged. Stay hopeful. Be at peace.
God is right on time. You can trust him. There that my little friend is with the cap turned around backwards, looking all cool and stuff. Can you stand up, son, and tell me your name? Josiah. What is it? Josiah. Josiah. Very cool name. I love it. I heard this, Josiah. You're going to grow up to be a man of great influence, not just for you, but for the glory of Jesus. You already influence your friends, often as a leader that they trust. You look around, and guys are just following you. Spend time in God's book. I encourage you to read a chapter in Proverbs each day, and the Holy Spirit will use that book to help you be a strong follower of Jesus and later on a man of wisdom and influence. Just start with reading Proverbs 1. Find an older person. It might be your parents. It might be someone older in the Lord. Someone you trust to help you understand and apply it to your life. Now listen, I'm not trying to freak you out or, or puff you up. But I did hear this. There could be greatness in you. If you'll follow Jesus with all your heart, he's got great things for you to do. Can I pray for you? Father, I just thank you for Josiah. I've been looking for young people just like him all over the nation. Lord, you're going to release them in this revival generation that's growing up. He's going to be one. He's going to have a voice. He's going to be a man of great influence with that call that's on his life. Lord, keep him close to you. In Jesus' name. You know, people ask me about uh, stuff all the time about the prophetic. And I get good questions and I get not so good questions. I was doing a Q&A with a bunch of young people a couple of weeks ago. And one of the qu first questions was, are those Doc Martens that you're wearing? <laughs> yeah, I'm wearing Doc Martens. But I've got a story about everything. A couple of weeks before that, I was in a meeting and this guy that was with me in the meeting uh, on, the, on the platform with us, the Lord spoke to him and says, I want to make Wayne's feet more beautiful. Would you give him your shoes? So he put, took off his Doc Martens. He walked away from that meeting barefoot. And I've been wearing these Doc Martens ever since. And since I've had that word, I prayed with over 400 people to give their lives to Jesus. How cool is that? One of the questions that people ask me all the time is, is how do you hear from the Lord? My mom hears from the Lord. My pastor hears from the Lord. My grandfather hears from the Lord. I just can't hear from the Lord. And I hear that all the time. And it grieves me a little bit. Well, it grieves me a lot. Because Jesus said that he expects everyone that believes in him to hear his voice. John 10, 27, he says, my sheep listen and they hear my voice. His expectation is that if you were a believer, you'd hear from God. He expects it. It's not just for special people. It's not just a sage on the stage. It's from us, all of us that are in the church bus. He wants to speak to all of us. But here's the problem. People have been taught that only the professionals can hear. Or maybe they're carrying around and seeing the dirt in their lives and not the gold. They think God can't speak to me because of what I've done. Let me tell you, there's forgiveness. But the central issue is this. There's only one legitimate reason why people should, could not hear from the Lord. It's this. If you're not a sheep, because he said, my sheep will hear my voice. Well, what makes you a sheep? That's when you get born again. That's when you give your life to Jesus. And he becomes the great shepherd in your life. And he begins to speak to you as one of his sheep. So the question becomes, how do I become a sheep? Paul shows us in Romans that if you'll confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Or it's with your mouth that you confess publicly. It's with your heart that you believe. 
Now, I, I like to do, not everyone likes to do this, but I like to do it publicly because I want, I want to give my life to Jesus in front of the whole world and all the angelics, angels and demons. I want them to know that I'm following Jesus. And I'm going to confess that out loud. So if you're here today and you'd like for me to pray a simple prayer with you to give your life to Jesus in salvation, I just want to pray. I don't want to call you out. I want to call you up to your destiny. And that starts when you bow your knee to him. This morning, 40 people gave their lives to Jesus in this room. It was amazing. It was amazing. If you would like for me to pray for you, would you do something courageous? Now, I know in Alabama, you have probably been to Alabama games and you probably screamed your head off and called yourself an elephant and all kinds of stuff you do. You don't care. You're a fan. Well, I'm just going to ask you to be courageous about the king of the universe. I'm going to ask you to stand if you want me to pray for you. Just go ahead and stand right now wherever you are. When everybody stands at once to, I'm going to pray. It's going to change everything about your life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just keep standing. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, um, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 8, 9, 40, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, Am I missing anyone? 56, 57, 58. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 59, 60, 61, 62, 63. Why do I count? It's because you count. In just a minute, we're going to pray and it's going to be written in heaven, the Lamb's book of life. Like you gave your life to Jesus on this day. 63, 64. Wow. 65, 66, 76, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76. Oh my gosh. Jesus, this is awesome. 75 people standing up to give their lives to Jesus. Hope I'm not missing anyone. All right, I want, you to, I want you to put your hand on your heart and I want you to, 76, 77, and I want you to pray out loud what you hear me pray, 78. God, 79. Eighty. There may be others. I want you to pray out loud after me. Lord Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Lord, my Savior, and my Shepherd. Today, I bow my knee to you. And I receive you, Jesus. And by your grace, I'll follow you all the days of my life. Amen. Amen. Right now in heaven, angels are rejoicing. The friends around you are going to join. We're so proud of you. So proud of you. Hallelujah. Oh, y'all did that, right? You know, Pastor Wayne said it's, uh, 
And so it's just a time to be all in because it's all his. And there's a lot of times we offer God a lot of things, but we hold back ourselves. And so for all of you that just stood, you just gave it all. And it's real. It wasn't emotion, it wasn't hype. I just want you to know that it's real. And I'm proud of you, way to go. In a moment, we'll have some of our ministry team here. And for all of you that would, just take one more step and just come up, let us pray with you. We'd love to know how we can help you, how we can resource you, because that's not a finish line. This is a, a starting line for you. An incredible journey, and God's gonna take you places you never dreamed you could go. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? If you will, guys, if you'll stand with me. Ministry team, guys, if you're here, come on up to the front. And if you prayed that prayer, or if you need prayer for anything, we're here for you. We'd love to pray with you. Again, don't forget, if you wanna put that, uh, you know, put your need on a card, you can drop that off as well. Normally, this is where I'll say, I'll see you next week, but I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna say, I'll see you this afternoon at 5.30. You may wanna get here a little bit early because I have a feeling we may have a problem with seating, but we'll figure it out. Um, see you this afternoon. God bless you. Love you, church. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in and, and for experiencing this service with us. What we find in scripture is an encouragement, not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And the encouragement that we want to leave you with in light of that is don't let this just be content. You see, on this platform, you'll see a lot of content. There's a lot of things that can fill a lot of your time, but we want this to be more. We want this to be life transformative in the next step that it sets up in your life. On the screen right now, you're gonna see a QR code just kind of flash up there. We'd love for you to scan that QR code, and what it's gonna be is it's going to help you find that next step to connect with us. And in that, we can help direct you to whatever is that next step in your life to connect you, not just with content, which you found, but also with the body, with other believers, with people who are walking the same journey, whether it be from a place of honest questions and doubt to a place of, hey, I want to grow and mature in my relationship with God. But we want to thank you for tuning in with us. We love spending the time with you, and we'll see you later.